Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon. Um, our first witness this afternoon is Mr. Malcolm Simpson. All right, over to you. Would you like to stand up, please? Could you just repeat after me. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Simpson. Hello, Sir Wynne. And thank you for being prepared to give your evidence a little early so that we can keep running smoothly. No trouble. Um, as I think you know, my name's Ruth Kennedy and I ask questions on behalf of the Chair. Um, have you got a copy of your witness statement there? I have, yes. I think it should be dated the 15th of January 2022? Yes, it is. And if you turn to the last page, which I think should be page 14... Yeah. Is that your signature there? It is. And have you read through this statement recently? I have. Is it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is indeed, yeah. Um, I'm just going to start by asking a couple of introductory questions about you. Um, how old are you now? I'm 60. And you talk in your statement about your wife. How long have the two of you been married? We've been together 25 years and um, married yeah, t nearly 20 years. How many children do you have? Um, I have two two sons from my first uh, marriage and um, Leslie has two children from her marriage so we have four consider as one family four four and uh, five grandchildren one on the way so family's ever growing what types of jobs did you have before you bought a shop could you describe for the chair uh, well when I left university um, I was um, working in uh, the forestry industry for a few years and then um, I had a small back injury and decided it was time to not be hanging on to a chainsaw the whole time so I, I joined b and I was with them for um, 12 years as an assistant manager and then a manager in a number of stores uh, and then I was a project manager uh, for the last two years with B&Q um, and then we, we took a year out to look for a shop, and, and that's when we found Boxgrove. Yeah, so I think you bought the Boxgrove Village store in 2003, is that's that right? That's right, yeah. Um, and there was a post office in your store already, is there? That... was. There was an existing post office with a, a sub-postmaster in situ, and and he stayed there. Um, we took the business over. We, we were quite happy with that arrangement, um, and it allowed us to focus on the, the retail side. Uh, the shop was quite run down, um, so we, 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 that was our skill set, if you like, at the time, was to, to boost the shop. We introduced loads of different things. And you end up taking over the post office. Could I, you just uh, describe how that happened? Of course, yeah. Um, the the, the sub-postmaster was there. Um, he uh, had to leave for personal reasons, and it uh, it seemed we'd been there four or five years then by then it just seemed an obvious transition really um, for me to take over the, being the sub postmaster um, it was a busy post office the salary was uh, attractive um, so that was the decision that was made and how did you feel about the prospect of taking over a post office? I, I can't say I was a hundred percent it's not um, something I, I it wouldn't have bothered me if we'd bought a shop without a post office, but it was there, it was an asset to the village, and um, it, it seemed the obvious thing for me to do it. But, I, yeah, I wasn't 100% happy about it. And I think you took it over in around 2007? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And I think you say in your statement you lived on the premises as well, is that right? Yeah, the, we, the shop we bought had a house, and uh, and the shop was all one... Uh, the shop was next door, if you like, of the house. Um, we bought it freehold, um, so the whole thing was ours. We split the title soon after we got there, so the shop and the and the house were separate titles. Because um, you never know when you work for yourself. You, you have to protect yourself a little bit, so we wanted to protect our house um, in case anything went wrong. Ironic, really. When you took over as sub-postmaster, what training did you receive? So there was um, it was a two-week training course, for want of a better word, um, over 
to lots of Monday to Friday in a Crown office in Bournemouth. And um, there was about 10 or 12 of us there. And there was all sorts of different people. Um, there, was, there was a chap who was buying a big post office. There was people who were just going to go and work in Crown offices um, as, as counter clerks. Um, and there was a couple of people like me who were sort of one man band. And I think you then have some in branch training as well. Well, the the two week training was was it was very much slanted towards sort of front office, so selling, um, and it was a time when post office was very keen for you to speak to every customer every week about insurance, mortgages, and things that when most of my customers were coming through. They were pension customers. They they weren't interested in insurance and telephone systems and mortgages, um, but they, that's what they pushed very much in that two week course. We did do um, we did do a couple of balances and sort of back office work, but nobody was that confident with it. Nobody was that happy with it, um, and nobody balanced in the training uh, and. It, the trainer implied that that was normal um, and that, yeah, sometimes it'll be up, sometimes it'll be under, um, but don't worry, just keep a pot of money in your safe and, and that'll allow you to put, put it straight each month. Um, and then, yes, after, after that training, when I went into the post office, um, a lady came, this was early December, uh, a lady came for for a week, but the local post office, the next one over from us, which was in a co-op, Tesco, Tesco, um, the sub postmistress there closed it for the whole of December because she was suffering from stress. So we picked up all the business that was would have gone to them, that everybody was coming to us, and we were queued out the door from nine o'clock till six o'clock every night. So the trainer didn't really train. She wasn't next to me. She was she was on the other terminal serving customers because the, the demand was so high. So it, it wasn't adequate training. And how did you find using the Horizon system at that time? Um, at that time, I wasn't the most computer literate person, and it, it, I found it quite a confusing system. It wasn't, um, it wasn't logical to me, and um, and it, it, it was, some of the procedures were painful, um, and, I, and I, I didn't do some of the things I didn't know how to do. Um, fortunately, most of my business was postal postage, uh, pensions, and we did a lot of car tax. Most of the car dealers from uh, Chichester came out to us, and uh, we did a lot of car. I did a lot of car tax, but I didn't find the system that friendly. How quickly did you start to notice shortfalls or discrepancies? Uh, the first, before the, that first Christmas, so uh, two, three weeks in, uh, a trainer came for one e the one Wednesday evening to, to do my first balance with me, and I think we were 150 pounds short. And he said, "Oh, that's the way it is. Um, go and get the money out of the shop till to balance, as if it was normal." And were they all sums like that initially? What kind? Initially, of they were they were in the low hundreds, um, or or a bit lower. Um, very occasionally, it was a little bit over, but. I can hardly remember a, a time when it was over. It was always under. And they, they were in the low hundreds to start with. What help did you make of the helpline? What you sorry, what um, use did you make of the uh, helpline? At, at first, I was quite facetious about it, because, and I called it the unhelpful line, because they, they weren't of any help at all. Um, it was always, oh, you'll, you'll get a correction through. Just put the money in. And um, or use the manuals. There was a, a whole shelf of manuals which weren't up to date and, again, weren't user-friendly, to, to my mind. How much do you think that you paid into the post office to balance? In total? Yes. Two and a half, three thousand pounds. And I think you were first audited in... 
October 2008, around that time, would yeah. that be right? Yeah. How many auditors attended? Uh, that first one, I think there was two. Um, and that's when they, they found a shortfall of about two and a half thousand pounds. And I, I made arrangements for that to come out of my salary. Um, and I, I didn't have that sort of money. It was all right taking a, a few hundred pound out the till now and again of the shop, but I, I didn't have that sort of money. I think you meant call that in your statement a payment plan. Is that yeah, that's right. Yeah, you agreed with them. Yeah, yeah, um, they dressed it up as a payment plan. Yeah, and I think then you were audited again in September two thousand and twelve. Is that about right? Yeah. yeah. How, how many auditors attended that audit? In total, there was. At any one time, there was four there, um, but they, they changed. They were there for four days, and they changed a couple of times. There, were, there was two that were there all the time, and then there was a couple of people came and went. Um, a couple of them spoke to us, and two of them didn't speak to us at all. Uh, they were, there was quite a hostile vibe coming off them. Um, we, we're always very welcoming of everybody who came into our shop and the kettle always went on and you know straight away and it was the same with these guys you know with the, the, I almost felt like um, I was pleased they were there because I thought we could get to the bottom of of the balance and, and then naively I thought to start with for the first hour um, we'll get the office straight we draw a line in the sand, move forward. You know, the payment plan was in for that money and, and we would go forward, but no, it didn't. Did the atmosphere change over the course of those? After years? about an hour, yeah. Um, and, yeah, they... they well, I'm sure you'll get on to the area manager's call in a minute, but, yeah, they, it changed after about an hour, hour and a half. How did you feel after they left? Uh, shell shocked, absolutely flawed, to be honest. And I think you say in your statement that they called you later to inform you of their findings. Is that right? Uh, after an hour and a half, one of them called me over. Um, I wasn't allowed to go into the office. We, we were the old style of fortress post office, so I was the other side of the screen. Um, and he said, um, it's not good. Uh, it, it, he didn't say why it wasn't good, he just said it wasn't good. I've now got to ring Nigel Allen, um, the area manager, and he'll need to speak to you. That was after an hour and a half. Um, and I, I, I felt like they already knew that the way it was going to go um, in that short time. And what did you, they tell you that they'd find? What short They form? didn't. No, oh, they... they they said, no, they didn't put a figure on it. They just said it wasn't good. It was that vague. And then later, I think, you, you, you receive a phone call. Is that right? Well, no, that was after an hour and a half. Um, this Nigel Allen person came on the phone and his first comment was, it's not good. You may as well resign. That was the first thing he said. By that time, I felt I was a bit on the ropes, to be honest, and... Um, my first thought was, going back to my B&Q days, was, hang on, this feels like constructive dismissal. And I, and I said that to him. And he very quickly wound up the call and, and he said, well, you're, you're going to be suspended. And then he hung up um, and that was it. And so, sorry, go on. No, no, you go on. OK. Um, so then they, they just carried on with the audit. I wasn't allowed anywhere near them. I wasn't allowed to speak to them. Leslie was still making them cups of tea, and um, it, it progressed for the rest, well, three, three more days. When were you suspended? Um, I think on the second day. Um, I, I, it's vague, um, uh, but I, I think Nigel Allen rang back just to say, you're suspended. Uh, because of what the auditors found. Um, and I think you gave the post office a cheque for um, what they said was the existing shortfall of around £7,000 yeah. later, is that right? Uh, yeah, that that was... Um, we then started having correspondence from 
Elaine Ridge, who I understood to be Nigel Allen's boss. Um, and verbally, she she spoke to Leslie. I by this time I wasn't in a fit state really to to talk to these people and was struggling um, to to do that without bursting into tears to be honest so um, she spoke to Leslie and she said that's the money that's missing you need to replace it now um, yeah um, and I think during that investigation um, what representation did you have at the time so um, the NFSP um, area rep came that first week in the evening with her son um, Primarily not to to help me or to represent me. We we September was starting, believe it or not, to build up for the Christmas rush, and we were very conscious it was a very busy time for this office. So, um, and we wanted the community to have a post office through Christmas. Um, so they came really to arrange for her son to come and be a stand-in postmaster in the office. Once that was all agreed, and this meeting in the evening, um, she then said, I can't come with, any, with you to any meetings. I can't represent you because my son's working here. You're on your own. That's, that was the word she used. And that, so there was, to answer your question, there wasn't any representation. And I think instead of attending hearings, you made written submissions. I did. I was in no state to go and um, defend myself by this time and uh, I also felt that it was completely stacked against me um, and I, I didn't see any point in going to, I think they wanted me to go to Southampton um, to just to, uh, I knew inevitably I knew I was going to lose my job so I just didn't want to put myself through that. What points did you make in your written submissions to that investigation? <sighs> Um, I, I, that I felt the whole thing was a sham, really, that, um, that there were things that had happened in the office that I hadn't had any help from, the help desk hadn't been any help. Um, one of the things we didn't do in this office was foreign currency very often. We did the occasional one for somebody going on a skiing holiday or whatever, and the, the, their currency would come... You'd, I'd order it, it would come in an envelope and then it, it was basically just scan a barcode and then it would it would work on the system. Um, and a few weeks before the audit, um, I think it was £12,000 worth of euros were delivered to the office and, and I didn't know how to put that onto the system. I couldn't get an answer from help desk. I tried them three or four times. And so I tried to put it on the system, but I wasn't convinced it had gone on properly. So I put all this into the letter about these euros, which was a significant amount of money. Um, and I think I mentioned, we, had, we used to have quite a lot of power cuts and um, things like that. So I, 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 even then I felt it was a system error. I knew I hadn't done anything malicious. So... Yeah, that's that, that's where I was at, really, with that, with that submission. What response did you get to those submissions? Um, just lip service, really. I complained about Nigel Allen's um, manner on the phone. That was ignored in the first response I got back from Elaine Ridge. The second one, she said, "I'll speak to him," and that was that was just lip service. And then. They write to you to the post office. Write to you to terminate your contract yeah, on I think the seventeenth right. of October, twenty twelve. Right. Yeah. And who did they ask to run the post office for them in the interim? Can I go back slightly? Of course. Um, early that year, um, I think it was in the summer. Um, we'd all, all the local sub postmasters had been invited to Portsmouth Football Ground to a presentation on a Sunday morning. Um, and it was about the network change uh, process. And there was a lot of anger in the room. A lot of the, the, the little one-man band guys like me didn't like what they were hearing. 
Um, there was talk of salaries going and it, everything being um, commission only. And we came away with, with three options. We were given three options. Um, the first one was um, to go with the change, um, take out the fortress post office and have an open plan post office in, in our shop, on our counter. The second one was to stay as we were. And the third option was to leave the post office and have the post office taken out. I opted, after discussion um, with, with Leslie, um, to stay as we were. Um, and you had to just fill in a box on the computer. It was pre-email day, or pre-email, anyway. So I opted out, and um, within weeks the auditors had come. So I, I, I felt, it, it almost felt like a closure program. The next village to us, Tangmere, um, the pub had just been bought by the co-op and we were convinced that they wanted to put the post office in there. Co-op refused. And so uh, I, I don't know the timescales, but it wasn't very long. Elaine Ridge rang Leslie back rang Leslie one day out of the blue and said, would you be prepared to take on the post office and be the sub-postmistress? <laughs> the response wasn't great, to be honest, because um, there was a lot of anger at the post office. And um, she was told in no uncertain terms, no, we'll have the post office here till after Christmas with the, the temporary sub-postmaster. But after that, you take, we take it out. It's a freehold property. We don't want the post office in here anymore. She then said, you can't do that. We'll decide when it comes out. And uh, Leslie said, no, you've got till the, the last Friday in February. If it's not out by then, your equipment will be on the pavement. You can't do that. We're post office, was the response. However, there was two guys there three days before the deadline, and they took all the equipment out. How did you feel about that behaviour by the post office? I just thought it, it was just arrogance beyond words, really. And, and just not understanding the situation and the damage they were doing, and then to come back and ask my wife to, to take over the post office after what they'd put us through. No, it was just unbelievable. But not surprising in, in the same way, because we'd got used to them by then. You mentioned previously the temporary sub-postmaster. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned in your statement that he found something in the post office. This was the first full week he did. Um, somebody must have met him from the post office to give him the keys, because obviously we weren't allowed the keys and the codes to the alarms and things on the Monday. And they did a... They did an audit, they uh, did a balance on that Monday. And um, the Wednesday was balance day, so he did a second balance on the Wednesday. And um, and then on the Saturday morning, we, Les and I were in the shop, we were serving customers, and his mother had come to work with him in the post office. And we heard a lot of banging and crashing and... and, and whispering and then at half past 12 one o'clock when they closed he came out with a, a big envelope stuffed full of stamps he said i'm really sorry but we found these stamps they're going to have to go on to the the deficit you owe the post office there's about four and a half thousand pounds worth of stamps here and um, fortunately, one of us, and it wasn't me, was really on the ball and Leslie said no hang on you've had two balances since you took over. They're not our responsibility, those stamps. And she was not happy. Um, I forget her name. Anyway, she was not happy with this. She said, well, we'll be speaking to Nigel Allen over the weekend. And that struck me as strange, that they had access to um, post office executives over a weekend. But anyway, the... the the son came in on the Monday and didn't mention the stamps. Um, and in the end, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to find out what's going on here because there's four and a half grand hanging over our heads. Went back to him 
And he said, oh, oh um, Nigel says, don't worry, we'll, 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 just don't worry about it. So it was just hushed over, just swept under the carpet. But the stamps did appear again in the February after the post office. When that last week, um, he came out with this bundle of stamps, and I assumed it was the same stamps. It must have been the same envelope, the same stamps. He said, there's four and a half thousand pounds worth of stamps here. You may as well sell those on eBay. Which was just gobsmacking, really. Did you think those stamps might have been what may have caused the... It's a similar balance to the stamps they said was short, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask you some questions now about the impact that all of this has had on you. Um, and firstly, I'm going to ask you about the financial impact. Um, you've already mentioned the money that you paid into the post office, but could you tell the chair about what other financial losses you've suffered as a result? So once the post office salary had gone, we had um, two ladies who worked part-time in the shop, and we had a lad who came and helped with the paper rounds on a Saturday, and they had to go the same week that I came out of the post office. Um, and and it, it's important to put names to these people, but, and especially Jan and um, Debbie who worked in the shop, because they were, Jan especially, she'd been there a long time. She'd, she'd worked with three, yeah, three owners, including us. So 30 years, I think, she'd been in the shop. So that was tough for her. And for Debs, um, and you know the little lad, he was on Saturday. He was a nice lad, but he understood that, that we just couldn't pay anybody anything. It was just us and and family when they could help out. So there was that impact. It, so it just wasn't the impact on us; it was them as well. Um, we would have stayed a lot longer if the post office had stayed and was was manageable. Um, we would have got to a stage where we perhaps could have had another sub post, somebody to work in the post office, and we would have stayed until I was, what, 50? Yeah, around 50 then. And um, it, we loved Box Grove. They loved us. It was, it was something we would have done till I retired. So there's, there's all that was lost financially. What about your salary? What job do you do now? Now, uh, I, I work part-time for a, a company called Cook, who, who sell um, frozen food meals, and um, I deliver for them three days a week. Did you have to borrow money from anyone? So the initial payment to Elaine Ridge in that first week, um, I went to my parents, because um, we didn't have that sort of money to, to pay them, and we paid them straight away. Dad gave me the money, and we, we paid how did it feel to have to borrow from It's you? humiliating. Um, 50 years old, going to your mum and dad. It's just not right. Um, <laughs> I understand that you were part of the group litigation group. Um, how much money have you received by way of compensation? Um, I, I, we had two payments from Freeth's um, and I, I think about 18,000 um, but I don't consider that compensation really. How are you doing now financially? So um, yeah, the, the, the driving work helps. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not fit enough to work um, five six days a week. When we were in the shop, we were both doing 80 hours a week, um, but it's your lifestyle, it's your, it's your social life, it's everything. Um, but I had two strokes, so... Yeah, I'm not... I'm a bit broken. <laughs> and I was going to ask you about the impact this has had on your health, and you've mentioned your two strokes. What other impact has this had on your mental and physical health? Sorry. 
please don't apologise and do let me know if you need a break. No, OK, thank you. Um, you're just cautious and scared. Um, I've always been somebody who respects authority and expects people to treat you as you treat them. And, and in everything I've done work-wise, it, it's always been, that's always worked until you come up against the post office. And, that, and they, they just, the, the same rules don't, don't work. They don't, they don't care about anybody. And, and that makes you anxious and scared all the time when you're, when you're working for them. And there's no support. There's no, excuse me, there's no, they don't care. They just don't, you know, you're just a number. Um, and that, I, 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 I couldn't cope with that. I've always worked in teams and with people who, there's mutual respect and there, there just wasn't any of that. And, and, and it just grinds you down. You just feel so alone. And and now since yeah I'm 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 not as confident as I was. Um, I, I, it's little things. I, I I don't like talking to people on the telephone. I'd rather be face to face. And uh, yeah, it just it just breaks you. You said a moment ago that you loved Box Grove and they loved you. What was the impact? on your reputation in the community. Okay, so there's two ways you can go about this when this happens. And our attitude from when the auditors were already there was to tell everybody what was happening and how we hadn't, I hadn't done anything wrong. It was a system. It was the way the post office worked. And we told everybody. And, and Leslie says the same. She must have bored people senseless because everybody who came in the shop I mean those first few days I wasn't really to be seen I'd get up early we start about four in the morning you get up early and do the papers and and but I wasn't really in the shop the first few days but um even going forward when the temporary sub postmaster was there we told everybody um and we weren't ashamed we weren't because we didn't see that we'd done anything wrong. We went to the parish council meeting, we told them what had happened, what our plans were going forward, um, because we, we desperately wanted to keep the shop going, you know. Um, it was just one other thing, just with this temporary sub-postmaster there, it felt as if we had an enemy in the camp, really, and they were listening to everything. So. We weren't shy in coming forward about saying how poorly and shabbily we felt we'd been dealt with by the post office. Um, what was the response of the people that you were speaking to? Was anyone... They were appalled, most of them. Um, the only negative we had, a friend of ours, uh, one of the builders who used to come in every morning, he'd heard a lady in the, the garage, which was literally at the end of the road, um, running me down and saying that I'd obviously stolen the money and um, I wasn't allowed to go and speak to her but Leslie went down two or three days later once she cooled down a bit and um, as she walked into the garage the woman stepped back she knew she'd stepped out of line and, and Leslie just told her what had happened um, quite in a quite forthright manner but uh, she <laughs> she <did. laughs> That was the only negative um, that we knew of. Um, and consequently, when we, when we came out and when we sold the shop, we were still living in the house next door. Um, and, and yeah, we, 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 we've still got lots. We don't live in the village anymore, but we moved last June, but we've still got a lot of friends. Um, 
and I've had emails and texts the last few days wishing me luck today. So. What about the impact on your marriage? <laughs> we... <laughs> She's the strongest person I know. <laughs> you know, she just... Oh, just gets on with it. And, uh, it's probably even stronger, our marriage, through, through it, all this. I can't look at her now because I will be crying. Was there any other impact on your family? Yeah, of course. You know, um, they all know me. They know I'm not a villain. I'm not a bad person. And it's distressing to see your dad your brother in, in, in this position. Um, but they all stepped up, they all worked in the shop when they could, when, you know, when other when their jobs weren't coming first. And yeah, they've 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 been tremendous. We we now live in an annex um of our daughter's house. Um and you know they're tremendous every day. But we you know we get to see one, two of our grandchildren every day as well, so that's a bonus. What would you like from the post office now? So... I'd like significant compensation paid to all the victims, including the 555, and paid now, plus the costs that are owed to the 555. It will never bring back loved ones lost or replace all the lost years, but it will allow every victim to move forward with some sense of security and with less stress, anxiety and hurt. I'd like the post office to start behaving with honesty and integrity, <laughs> providing full and open disclosure going forward. They will never extinguish the deeply embedded toxic culture that still exists until there is root and branch change. This change will only come through closing this devastating chapter fully by coming clean and admitting all the lies and exposing all the guilty at all levels of the organisation. <sighs> On a wider note, I'd like to see national recognition for Alan Bates, Nick Wallace, Carl Flinders, Ian Hislop and the Private Eye Journalists, Lord Abuthnot and others, because without all of them, we would not be sat here today and this scandal would have been buried by the post office and others in government forever. We all owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Um, that's it on the post office. I've got a couple of other bits I'd like to say, is that all right? Please. So these people, they take away your sense of worth, your sense of self. There's no need to invest in the individual, to nurture, to develop. No desire or culture to help people grow, to make them feel valued. Instead, they're just lies, indifference, aggression, all take demands for total loyalty to the brand and blind acceptance that post office is always right. The reality is the complete opposite. 
the only people within the whole post office structure who are held accountable for every action, every stamp, every penny, as sub postmasters. And that accountability is managed by a totally corrupt computer system, which is not fit for purpose, and a system that is policed by a corrupt hierarchy who spout the party line over and over. Horizon is robust and works very well. You are the only person in the whole network who is having problems. Nigel Allen told me that. Auditors arrive, turn your business into a crime scene, provide no written evidence, get the contracts manager on the phone after just one and a half hours and his first statement is, well, you need to resign. When I reacted to this, he just hung up. He knew he didn't have to argue with me. Everything is stacked in his favour. He knows I'm going to crash and burn. After all, sub-postmasters are totally expendable. <laughs> You're belittled by the whole process. You can't prove your side of the argument. You can't defend yourself. There is no support, no honest, fair process. <laughs> You're alone. As we've already heard this last couple of weeks, it's too much for many. You feel abandoned, tainted, and that is what they want. A quick cull, grab some money, move on to the next victim, leaving heartache, anguish and devastation in their wake. If you're lucky, when I was, someone steps up, trusts you and guides you through the calm to calmer times. They carry the whole burden until you recover. Eventually you dig in, start afresh, reinvent and move on. But the hurt and pain is always there, buried deep, suppressed, but always eating away. After a stroke, you're known as a stroke survivor. I'm lucky enough to myself to consider myself a post office survivor as well. But they damaged me and tried to damage myself, my worth my family, my business, and my community. Last bit. I fear for this inquiry in the long run because the actions of the post office previously all show that they will do anything at any cost to protect themselves. The civil case was fought in the most aggressive manner by post office. And when they attempted to recuse Judge Fraser and tarnish his reputation, it showed everyone just how low they were prepared to go. Be careful, Sir Wynn, and your colleagues here at the inquiry. Post Office will try every underhand, dishonest and evil tactic to destroy any threat. And they have powerful friends who will back them all the way. They don't want the truth to come out. And if they, if they carry on as they are, I fear for all your reputations and well-being. Messrs Scully, Quarteng and Reed. Through your delaying and blocking a proper compensation for all the victims of this scandal, you are as guilty and complicit as Venels, Van der Bogart, Elaine Ridge, Nigel Allen and all the others who bullied and terrorised so many. Sort it out. Now. Do the decent thing for once and put the victims first. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the chair? No. Thank you. I'm just going to turn to the chair now to ask if he has questions for you. Chair, do you have any questions? No, thank you. But I would like to thank Mr Simpson first for his witness statement, next for his oral evidence, and then thirdly for taking the time and trouble to write what is really qu quite a formidable speech that you gave me right at the end, Mr Simpson. So thank you very much. And um, thank, we, thank you for introducing me to Mrs. Simpson, who's always be, been a great source of support to you. So thanks very much. Thanks, Wynne. Um, 
Chair, our next witness is Mr Gordon Martin, who's appearing remotely. And I propose we take a short 10-minute break and perhaps come back at 25 past? Certainly. Fine. Thank you. Hello, Chair. Our next witness is Mr Gordon Martin. We've already had a chat. I, I don't suppose you'd be surprised to learn that, Miss Kennedy. <laughs> um, if you want to. Good afternoon, Mr Martin. I'm Jane, and I'll take you through the affirmation. OK? If you'd like to repeat after me, I do solemnly... I do solemnly... Sincerely and truly... Sincerely and truly... Declare and affirm... Declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, Mr. Martin, I think you know my name is Ruth Kennedy and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Have you got a copy of your witness statement there? I have. I think it should be dated the 20th of January 2022. That's correct. And is your signature on the last page, page 14? Page 14, yes, it is my signature. Have you read through this statement recently? Yes, I have. Is it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. And you've also provided us with a chronology, um, and I understand that that's currently being turned into an exhibit. So thank you for that. OK. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start by asking a couple of introductory questions about you. Um, how old are you now? I should be 78 next week. And can you tell us a little bit about your family? I'm on my second marriage. I have a son who lives in America who has decided to estrange himself and his granddaughter that I've never met. I have two stepchildren. One lives locally with two uh, granddaughters. And a stepdaughter who lives in Queensland, in Australia, with two grandsons. Prior to working for the post office, can you tell us about the types of jobs that you had? I left school and joined the civil service um, as a temporary job because my main aim was to join the Royal Air Force. I wanted to be a photographer and it was one of the cheapest methods at that time of achieving a qualification. I served nine years during the Cold War, a very awkward time. I came out because my son was due to go to school and we didn't want to go to school in the area that we lived. We moved to High Wycombe and I took a job in the film industry. I worked for Rank Films at Denham Studios producing Rushes Overnight. The family, or my wife's family, were talking of moving to Cornwall to find a small business. And there was a, a pause in there, um, seeking of, of a, a, an option, but we made the move first. And my wife moved to Cornwall with my son whilst I tried to sell the house. Uh, at that time, the housing market collapsed, and that took me 12 months to sort that out. I eventually moved to Cornwall, and my wife had a small boutique. And it didn't really pay enough money, so I took a job in security. Having been in the Air Force and security cleared at a very high level, it was very easy for the um, security company to get me through their books. Difficult times, over nine years, I had to learn on the job. I had no experience whatsoever. Uh, I dealt with security for major companies. So I knew everybody's cash movements. I knew their security measures. And it was a trusted job. I was promoted and moved to Bristol, but my wife didn't really fancy moving to Bristol. And the only other option really was to move on. And I took up a, an option which was to prove quite difficult. And that was selling microcomputers. At that time, there was next to no dealerships in microcomputers. Everybody was into mainframes, and really there were only toys on the market. So I got involved in selling. I got involved in programming, training. 
I was the sales director. And we had a very, very successful two years, at which point Fujitsu bought out the Japanese company that we were dealing with and immediately closed our uh, options on equipment. This left us with no option but to move out of the business. Uh, for a few weeks, I hesitated as to what I was going to do with life, and I did quite a bit of computer consultancy work uh, and also ordinary business consultancy work, helping new, new form companies. Then I got involved in retail with uh, a Tandy franchise. But first, I managed a franchise and we were so successful that the owner of the business and his wife had too much work to do because I was performing too well. So they decided that they were going to sell the business and I purchased it. Um, I did a deal with them. Uh, the, deal, the lease was up, so we moved the premises. We got involved with Tandy. We had a thing called Photostop, which was a one-hour photo uh, processing business. We ran a cyber cafe. We ran a games room. Uh, we got involved with uh, selling games machines. We set up a web design company. And everything was going very, very well. And then Tandy pulled out of the UK, sold off to uh, Carphone Warehouse. Carphone Warehouse didn't want the Tandy set up. What they wanted really was the shops that Tandy owned to set up phone shops. So I was left with a building with a lease for which I was going to be responsible and no business. I spoke to friends who actually pointed me in the direction of running a pound shop. This was before most of the big pound shops came on the market and we were a fairly new innovation. And it was very successful. And my main wholesaler, had had a problem with one, with one uh, customer that he had who was not paying his bills and he took it over and suggested that I should run it for him. So I took over the second shop, which was in the sorting office at the post office in Falmouth in Cornwall, just some distance away from home. After we'd been there a very short while, the post office sent a message through to me via the agent from my landlord. Did I want a post office? And I didn't really take them very seriously at the time. I was working 16 hour days along with my wife and we were absolutely shattered at the end of every week. We didn't really want any more responsibility. So if you want to ask questions from then on, really. <laughs> um, thank you. So at that stage, the post office has approached you and is asking if you're interested and you've described why you weren't. How did you end up then running a post office? It was a matter of attrition, really. <laughs> um, the post office, I didn't know it because we were in there too early in the morning and working too late at night. We didn't realise that the the uh, Crown Office in Falmouth was going to be sold off to a private uh, supermarket. And the Commercial Workers Union and the staff and the NUJ between them set up a campaign to try to gain back their work. They, there was a loss of jobs and all the rest of the unions weren't prepared to accept that. And they ran um, a campaign out in, out in the square with boards. And I never even realised it. I hadn't even given it thought. And they, they won. The post office pulled out their, their offer to the supermarket on safety grounds. So this left them with a problem. They didn't own the building. They'd sold that in previous years. They had a lease running out, which was going to be... The building was going to be redeveloped, unknown to me. Um, and they were going to have to either sign a new lease or pass on the business. They made the policy decision that they would sell on the business. Uh, 18 months they haggled with me. Um, I kept on saying no. Uh, they kept pushing up the offer. Started out at 75,000 to run the office and it ended up at 125,000 pounds a year. 
It was a large office. We're talking about uh, a dedicated ex um, currency exchange, a seven position post office with fortress, and in a very, very desirable trading position. In the end, I had to make a decision. My business was going to close anyway because the landlord was going to redevelop the property. So we decided that we'll go for broke. We'll go for it. I was at that time, I was 60, 62. And we were only three years off retirement. And a friend of mine said, you do realize that if you've got 125,000 salary on a post office, plus a retail business that's got a footfall of over a thousand a day, it's going to be a fair old business to sell on and you could retire comfortable on that. So we decided that that's, that's what we would do. We'd go for broke. Our daughter in Australia was struggling, so we promised her that at 65 I would retire, I would sell the business, and we would move out to try to support her. That wasn't to be. What were the terms of the deal with the post office in the end? 125,000 a year. Um, they insisted that it had to be an open plan office. This was the new idea. An open plan office with a, with a small, what we call a fortress position. Um, my wife always dreamt of a cafe. We opened the front of the building up as a cafe and we put our retail in, in the middle of it. And the the post office came up with all sorts of requirements. Um, I didn't have the time. I was working too many hours a day. So the business uh, business manager who was speaking to us uh, actually produced all the cash flows without referring to me. He also produced a business plan without referring to me. And he announced that we'd, we'd won the... Uh, the, the franchise and that we could go ahead. The various promises of uh, supplying safes and all, all, all sorts of other bits of equipment. Um, and it would be a, a walk in, walk out. So as their staff walked out, we would walk in and take over uh, with whatever equipment and, and, and office furniture that was available. And how was this financed? Right, well, we decided that seeing we were going to uh, disappear off to Australia, what we didn't want to do was end up three years down the line but have to try to find a buyer for the house. So we put the house on the market. 60,000 of that went into the business. 20,000 went into the bank to try to support ourselves for the next, uh, next few years. Um, 80,000 was paid to us by the landlord because we were going to have to give up our leases and he paid us compensation of 80,000. The post office introduced us to the bank um, who promised us um, a good working overdraft, which when the business, when, when the shop had been redeveloped uh, and we were back in that building, they would convert that to a business loan. Uh, and still leave us with a small, uh, small overdraft facility. Um, after we moved in, it was chaos, absolute chaos. How many members of staff did you have working for you in your various businesses? Uh, we had 24 staff in total. When you took over the post office, what training did you receive? I was supposed to go on a training course, which turned out to be uh, talk of how we would transfer the business, uh, all the things that need to be done on day one, uh, all the things that we need to put into place. Um, I, I had 10 staff who were ready to move in to the post office. I had um, interviewed them. Um, we were still waiting for the post office to uh, verify that they had checked them out um, right up to the last minute. So there was a bit of a panic going on. And a week before we took over the post office, they, the post office took a room in a local hotel um, where they set up a dummy system and they uh, operated there for a week. Um, they came out on the Friday and they had two days off to sort themselves out with uniform, this, that and the other, 
uh, and then we took over on the Wednesday. And the post office that you took over, you were guarantor of the Moore Falmouth? Is That's that right? correct. And that was from the 20th of March 2006, is that right? That's correct. Um, how soon after starting to run the post office did you start to notice shortfalls and discrepancies? Well, for the first two weeks, we were supposedly had four trainers with us. Also, the assistant manager from the original post office was due to retire in four weeks' time, so they kept her on in the post office as part of the training team. At the end of the first period, and the rollover had to happen, our staff had been given no training on, 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 the, on the rollover of the branch. She knew that. Um, without, uh, without talking to anybody, she automatically went out and did the rollover and announced that everything was fine. We, I was quite surprised that it had even been done. Uh, bearing the size of the branch, I can't, I can't believe that she did it in the time. You bear in mind that even, even the vault was a room 10 by 10, lined with shelving full of foreign currency and money and coin. I can't believe she even checked it. But anyway, she announced that it was all done and we rolled over. The next trading period, all the training staff had gone, had left. In fact, most of them left after a couple of days. They couldn't take the, uh, the strain of the, of the takeover of the branch. So that period, our staff were left in the dark as to how to do the rollover. When you take a list out of the machine and try to check your transactions, it's a piece of paper just over three inches wide. Bearing in mind that we have six positions open most of the time for 14 days, thousands and thousands of transactions. It was like ticker tape, paper absolutely everywhere. First thing you do is you check all your various stocks. Each member of staff has their own private stock that they're responsible for. They each balance their own stock. That stock then goes into the safe and then you're left to do the foreign currency and the vault, and you have to then do your balance. All those stocks individually balanced. The vault was correct. The foreign currency was correct. When they tried to roll over, it came back with a 2,000 de deficit. Nobody could explain it. The manageress that I had employed was pulling a hair out. We had a problem in that because it was in the old Crown office, we were still under the control of the post office security setup, which meant they controlled the time locks on the safes, they controlled the alarm system and the monitoring system. And at eight o'clock, we had a deadline. We had to close. At that point, we hadn't found it. The help team, huh, the help team. They decided that we should roll over, irrespective. We had to close. We didn't have any choice. If we didn't, if we didn't roll over at that time, we couldn't open the next morning. So on their advice, we rolled over. Uh, the next morning, I got in touch with the help desk, and they said, well, if you're 2,000 pounds short, I'm afraid you're going to have to put it in. Uh, Easier said than done. <laughs> so um, I contacted the business development manager. Um, he promised me he'd come back and tell me what was going to happen. Um, he never did come back. Uh, I contacted uh, Chesterfield. They said to me, put the money in. Simple as that. And when I said, well, I can't find out where the money is. There's no deficit on any of the stocks. There's no deficit in the safe. But we've ended up with this, this shortfall of £2,000. So they agreed that they put it into a suspense account. Uh, and I was going to argue black with blue that this, this, this wasn't going to happen. That they weren't going to take £2,000 off of me. Not, not for all the tea in China. And this set up... A, rather bad relationship between me and the post office. They didn't like people answering back. They were in charge, they were running the show, and basically you do as you're told. And did you continue to notice further shortfalls? 
we had another shortfall um, on the currency desk. We had um, a cruise ship come into Falmouth full of Americans, thousands of them, um, or it appeared to be thousands of them. Um, and their next port of call was somewhere in Europe. So they were all coming in, changing dollars to euros, uh, pounds to euros, dollars to pounds. And the post office was absolutely rammed that day. It was busy. And I decided to help out by going onto the foreign currency desk, which was a dedicated desk. And we still had one trainer with us at that time who sat with me and we went through the process. And he just couldn't believe the amount of business that we were doing. He kept on going off and having cups of tea and cigarettes and things. Um, at the end of the end of the day, uh, we shut the desk down and I ran a balance on the desk and we were 800 pounds down. Uh, I said, what do we do now? So he said, well, you have to put the money in. Simple as that. I said, but there's got, be, there's got to be a reason for it. You sat here, you watched me, you've done transactions with me. Nothing strange has happened. What's, why should there be a, a deficit of £800? He said, well, it'll come back. Don't worry about it. It'll come back. I didn't understand why, but said it would come back. So I went next door and robbed £800 out of the, out of the daily takings. And I bought, effectively, um, dummy currency. 800 pounds for nothing, uh, never did come back. How did you feel about not being able to solve the problem or find what went wrong? Well, I'm used to computers, I've done programming, I've done training. And to me, there seemed something very amiss with, if there was something wrong with balancing, then there should have been an error message or something come up on, on the system. But nothing ever did. Um, there had to be something else going on, and when I inquired about it, no, no, nobody else has a problem with the system. It can't be the computer. We would know about that. Um, and after that, silence. Communication cut down. No matter who I tried to speak to, they were in meetings. Everybody's in a meeting. We always said that if the post office cut their meetings down, they'd probably cut their staff in half. Um, you mentioned in your statement that you had four audits during your time at the post office. Um, I, I think... So you... Yeah, I, th I think it was four. The first one was my request when we couldn't find the £2,000. Um, I can't remember how long after it was, but we had three people turn up early one morning. We weren't allowed to open. And they went through and they came back and said, well, there's £2,000 missing. And I said, I know that. I said, I've told everybody that. Everybody knows we're £2,000 down. It's in the suspense account. I was rather hoping you could tell me where it was. Uh, they said, well, no, we, 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 we can't. We, we don't have the power to find that. All we can do is come and count your money. Uh, rather a waste of time, really. And then the second time they come back, I think in your statement you say it's around February 2007, and you mentioned that they threatened you with legal action. Could you tell us that, a bit about that? Yeah, that was after when uh, after we'd been in the, the main post office for a while, uh, we were supposed to have, as they developed the building, we were supposed to move units around within the building and stay in the same building. And in the end, the post office agreed that uh, under self health and safety rules, they didn't want their customers in a, in a building site. So, along with my landlord, we found up the road there was a charity shop which was um, going to be moving. So, we gave them a donation and we did a refit. Um, the total refit costs were only estimated by the post office to be 80000 uh, We spent more than that um, putting the charity shop to rights to open up uh, as a temporary office. Uh, we hadn't been in there long when the audit team turned up. Uh, there again, there's three of them. Two, two of them were bean counters and the third guy didn't really say very much. Uh, but at the end of the bean count, the guy came and he said, that £2,000 still missing. But I said, I oh, know, it's in the suspense account. I have an agreement and I won't pay it. 
and not until you can tell me where the £2,000 has gone. We haven't got it. I trust my staff. There must be a good reason for it. And then the third guy got involved and said, well, it's quite simple, really. If you don't really pay the £2,000, then we'd have to look at your contract. Uh, we'd have to look at whether we can put you back in the new building that's being developed, which was a bit self... Um, uh, it was a bit of a problem for them because they wouldn't have had a post office left at that time, so I didn't understand that line. And then they said, well, the only other action is we're going to have to take legal action against you to pull back the money. So at that time, I had that much money invested. I couldn't really afford to, to let it go, so I took the checkbook out and gave them a cheque for £2,000. And I think just after that second audit, in around May 2007, you you say you emailed the CEO of the post office, Adam Crozier, at that time. Is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, we had all sorts of problems going forward. Whenever the, whenever the post office staff turned up, which was quite regularly, there's always something else that we're going to have to buy. Um, and the money was disappearing out the door like nobody's business. We'd, we'd, we'd moved into the new building by this time and uh, we'd refitted that. So we'd put our, our pound shop back in place. We'd put a cafe back in place. And we're now running a, a cost of getting on for 250000 uh, I had to sell my first shop. Um, I had to sell it really for a pretty low figure. Um, but we maxed out some credit cards, um, and we now had got two years before retirement. So we were hanging on by our, by the skin of our teeth. And the business manager turned up and said to me about. Uh, she thought things were getting a bit tight, but they and I said, "Well, yes." And I confided in her that we'd spent a lot more money than we'd anticipated, and really we could do with some help, and maybe a little bit less of the post office demanding so much from us. And I didn't get any answers, and no matter who we spoke to, we couldn't get any answers out of anybody. The two thousand pound got it in my craw. I could I. It was on it. Under the scheme of things, two thousand pounds when you've invested two hundred and fifty thousand is not a lot of money. But it was the principle that they didn't want to investigate what the problem was. So one day I got so fed up, I took out of my laptop and I managed to find the email address of Adam Crozier, who was the CEO. Uh, and I fired off an email. And I put down the branch number and all the details, and underneath it, I put lots of questions. People are listening, but we're not getting any answers. The next day, I had a visit from the area manager who said to me, you can't do that. Nobody talks about Adam Crozier. I don't suppose he even saw it. I'd probably find one of his minions took, took the email anyway. We don't talk to Adam Crozier. He's, he's in charge of the business. He doesn't have time to talk to people like you. Uh, what, you what you're doing is you're, you're setting up a problem for yourself and somebody's going to look at your contract. This was a, a, a theme that seemed to go on. We'll look at your contract. And then I think after that, you had a third audit that passed without issue. Is that right? That's correct. Um, yep, yeah, came in. There was perfectly satisfied. It was the same two guys. Um, they were happy with everything. Um, carried on. And then the final audit happened in February 2008. Can you tell us about what happened then? Right. Well, after I paid the £2,000, within a few days of the £2,000, we were getting ready to go back to the old, the, the old building. Um, the post office had put a deadline on us to uh, actually have the post office open. And that was going to be four weeks to completely rebuild a post office. Had people lined up ready to do that. And then we had a problem. The builder or the developer went bankrupt. And we were left with a building, no electric, no water, no ceilings. 
uh, a multi-level of floors, pillars left in places that weren't supposed to be there. And I contacted the bank and said, look, you offered us at the time that you would convert our overdraft to a business loan. And they said, well, we hear your contract is uh, a little in jeopardy. Maybe we ought to rethink this and um, we'll just leave you with an overdraft. <laughs> we were a little bit uh, shell-shocked, to say the least. Um, fortnight later, we moved into the new building uh, and the post office were all over us. Uh, we had their staff telling shop fitters what to do, spending my money left, right and centre. I had the area manager actually ordered on my behalf uh, digital scales, another bill to cover. Um, then we found out, or I found out afterwards, that you, that they had changed the uniforms. And part of my agreement was that my staff had to be in uniform. Uh, we don't just recently spent God knows how much money buying, buying all the uniforms. And now she, without uh, contacting me, ordered all new uniforms for my staff. Wasn't, wasn't given the option. So now we're beginning to really run out of money and things are getting really tight. So I put the business on the market. We went through Dalton's uh, and another organisation, which I can't remember. They valued it at 650,000 plus stock as valuation. Um, we had one initial inquiry which didn't want the post office. All they wanted was the shop because of its good trading position and its size, getting on the 3,000 square feet. Um, and I felt that was wrong. We had staff to would be nurtured and trained and they didn't deserve to be out of a job. So I turned them down. Then we had another inquiry from the Midlands, a chap had been down. He actually put a deposit on a house and was looking for a business and he was really pushed for the push for the post office. He was going to run that, his wife was going to run the shop and his daughter was going to run the cafe. Uh, looked the ideal marriage to me. Everything was good, he was happy with the money. He contacted the post office, the post office came back and dropped the salary from 125,000 back to the original starting figure that we spoke of, of 75,000, which was totally unviable. The wage bill was 100,000 a year for the post office staff, just not viable. Uh, they also told you it would probably take six months to set up any form of contract uh, with the amount of work that had to be done. So he pulled out. The bank became aware that I'd got property on the market and just before Christmas phoned me up in late December and demanded to recall the overdraft. Uh, we had just been paid by the post office and I paid their salaries. And I'll backtrack a bit here, back when we first moved in and I was falling out with staff we had two people arrive with the area manager who was being shown around the shop, but I didn't know who they were. I'd just come back from the warehouse and they were introducing these two people to my staff. And I said, who are they? Uh, and they said, well, they run an organisation that actually runs failed post offices. Very strange. They're currently running over 70 post offices. I thought, this is stupid. How can you run 70 post offices, one organisation? They're funded by the post office. I asked them to leave. They were upsetting my staff. They, my staff wondered what on earth was going on, so I asked them to leave. So in the January, uh, things got very tight. Business gets, goes quiet in January after the rush of Christmas. Uh, we moved into February. Um, I put my last 10 grand in to keep the business running over, over Christmas um, to preserve the business ready for the new people who wanted to buy it before they decided to pull out. We moved to the end of the month and I, the post office were nagging me on a daily basis. I was getting so cheesed off. I'd always run my own business. I'd always been in charge of my business. But this felt as if 
they were running the business and I was having to just pick up the bill all the time. It was a problem after problem. So I threatened to close the doors. The moment I threatened to close the doors, all hell broke loose. On, it was the Monday that I threatened to close the doors and on the Wednesday the audit team turned up. The audit team turned up. We weren't, weren't allowed anywhere near the, the counters. My staff had to stand outside. Uh, they found a surplus. Not a deficit, they found a surplus. They wouldn't tell me how much. The manageress had been ferreting away a few surpluses in case we had a deficit again and to allow for any error notices that came back. Um, at the end of the audit, these two people walked back in again who had been in previously and introduced themselves. They were ex-post office managers from the Midlands. The audit main ma audit man came out and asked for the keys. So I said, what's, what's the problem? Have you got a problem? Oh, no, 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 no problem. Um, we just think that your contract needs to be looked at and these two people have come in to run your branch. So I sat down with my wife uh, and a couple of the staff and we discussed what on earth we were going to do. And, OK, we couldn't run the post office at that time because they didn't want us to run the post office now. So we decided, OK, we'll run the cafe, we'll run the shop and we'll fight it. We were then informed by the audit team that because it was an open plan office and the security systems were dependent on the whole shop and not just part of the shop, we should pick up our coats and leave. Uh, we never went back. They ran that office for, to my knowledge, three years on the equipment that we had paid for and installed. They ran the cafe, they ran the shop, until they finally moved the post office back into the shop that the post office first wanted to put it in some years before. And they never, never had the decency to even forward my mail onto me. And how did all of this make you feel? I've lost everything. I was up to my debt, up to my neck in debt with credit cards who were beginning to push me now. Uh, we had a visit from um, a bailiff because the rates bill wasn't being paid. Uh, had a visit from the tax office who wanted to know why there wasn't a return. Um, and I explained that all my records were in the post office. I wasn't allowed in to get my records. My computer with all the wage information, everything was on it. I didn't even know where it was. Uh, he picked up his mobile phone and phoned his head office, explained the situation, and he said, um, message came back, could you estimate how much you owe us? I said, my estimation is nothing at the moment. Um, he gave him a cup of tea and he sat there for a while thinking about it, made a few more phone calls. He phoned the VAT office and told them what had happened. He had a word with the PAYE office told them what had happened. We never heard another Dickie Bird from them. We never heard anything more from the bank. Uh, we heard nothing more from the post office until August when we received a termination of our contract. And I think you also mentioned in your statement that the post office tried to recla reclaim sums from your insurance. Is that right? <sighs> when I, I don't know if it's the same with postmasters in little sub-offices or whether it only applies to the Crown offices. But they, what they try to do is to claim back a percentage of your salary to ensure all, that, all their property and money in the shop. Now, I already had a very good uh, insurance with a broker who I'd worked with for years. He knew the situation, he knew exactly what our liabilities were. Accepted that 
and our insurance carried on. Absolutely no problem. When we closed the post office, the post office decided that they were going to come back now and give me a bill for two years' insurance, even though I was insured. They never, ever accepted that I was fully insured. Turning then to the financial consequences that this has had on you, um, I believe you were declared bankrupt, is that right? We were declared bankrupt in the August. Um, my wife had several credit cards and I had several credit cards and a personal loan at the bank, unsecured. Uh, we had no choice. We were being hounded left, right and centre. Life was becoming a misery. My wife at one stage, at the height of all the problems, had a stroke. Um, she was no, in no real fit state to fight anybody. Uh, she lived dreading a knock on the door. She didn't want to answer the phone. Um, she had become a recluse. Uh, I brazened it out. I've always been a bit shouty, uh, prepared to defend myself. But she couldn't do that and her health was suffering. So I decided the only answer really was to go bankrupt, um, which we did. And then we had to go through the whole shenanigans again with the, uh, with the receiver. And what about any further employment? Did you get another job? I went to the job centre and they said, how old are you? And I was, uh, I think I was about three days off being 64. And the young lady just smiled and looked at me and said, I, I don't think so, not at 64. Uh, I think you better consider that it's early retirement. Um, I don't think anybody a queer, query benefits. Um, I suggest you go home, sit on your bum. What happened to your retirement plan? Well, that went out the window, um, which really broke my wife up. I didn't find out until six months ago that um, she came on, her doctors were quite concerned about her and sent her to the um, mental health team. And I found out for the first time that when life was tough, she had threatened to take her life. And how did that make you feel? Very inadequate. What about the impact that all of this has had on your health? Um, until recently, I didn't think it had really affected me. I buried it. Two weeks ago, when my name appeared on the schedule for this inquiry, Somebody queried who I was. My name hadn't really come up in anything. I kept my head down. And I had a call from uh, the JFSA as I was part of the litigation. And uh, Alan Bates said to me, he said, I've had a call from the Sunday Times. They want your story. They don't know who you are. So I thought about it for a while and I thought, do I really want to go through it all again? So I contacted David Enright. And David said to me, if you can do it, we would appreciate the fact that your story is out there. So later that night, I took a phone call from Sunday Times, nice young lady who probably spent the best part of an hour and a half with me. And she gleaned enough information to write a story. I pictured it would probably be on page 20 or buried somewhere in a corner. They sent a photographer down to photograph me in the local area, managed to catch me standing beside a postman who just happened to be there. I don't know if she's, no, she's in the Times at the moment. 
Um, the article came out on the Sunday and I had various phone calls from people saying, what's all this about? I didn't know you were involved in this. But the headline that hurt me, the post office, I'd taken away my chance to be your grandfather. Sorry. Please don't apologise and please let me know if you'd like a short break. No, it's okay. Turning to your family in Australia, what impact has this had on them? They've had tough times. My son-in-law puts in uh, fibre optics into new into houses as a subcontractor. Um, the main contract changes hands from time to time, and each time he seems to be on the wrong end of somebody going bust and not getting money. So my daughter is a very strong character, and she goes out and digs holes with him. <laughs> to dig holes in the middle of the day in Queensland in temp temperatures of 30 degrees takes some guts. But her family has had great difficulties, obviously, with her working with two growing children who are in need of us. And we weren't there. Turning to your, the community, um, what impact did this have on your standing in the community? I don't know. We've never been back to Falmouth. Because of this? Yeah. I think you mentioned in your statement that there was an issue with your staff's pay. Is that right? There was. Um, when these two guys took over the running of the post office, the terms were that they would honour holiday agreements and a few days of overtime that was, that was due. Uh, we paid the staff right up to date. They didn't lose anything. Uh, a few weeks after we left, they reneged on that deal and said to our staff, you're owed money. Um, they brought in a person from uh, citizens, citizens' Advice and they sat them down and asked them how much they owed. They all inflated their figures. I know the figures were nothing like the figures that they were quoting. And they took it to small claims court. They, they were people we'd helped, employed, nurtured, looked after. And they were taking us to court. How did that feel? It broke my wife. She's never got over it. You mentioned in your statement um, that you lost some friends over this. Is that right? Well, the staff were our friends. Um, we'd helped them. One young lady had had a window smashed by her daughter's boyfriend in a, in a fit of tempo. She hadn't got the money. We paid for a replacement. Another one had got problems paying rates and was going to end up in court. We paid them. Uh, another one was on the breadline with young children and we gave her money to help her out as a loan. We never saw back and there she was taking us to court. You also mentioned in your statement that you had threats made. Could you tell us about those? <sighs> I don't want to be specific about that. This, I can't face that one. How did it feel to be threatened? I've never been threatened in my life. Apart from on the East German border. 
I've always got on with people. Being a salesman at heart, you learn to accept people as they are, see their better side. Never been involved in anything like it in my life. And after 65 years of being on this planet, I certainly didn't expect it then. What would you like from the post office now? Well, there's the obvious things. I've, I've made copious notes over the last fortnight. I've heard so many people on this inquiry come forward with their requirements and their, their needs, but they all say the same, basically. So I'll just read what I put here. Apart from the obvious, that is compensation, all sub-postmasters... I can't see a thing now. <laughs> uh, sub-postmasters need their compensation in full without prolonged negotiations and individual interaction. So, so eliminating more grief and trauma for all concerned. Fujitsu. Apart from the police investigation, the company should be held partly responsible for financial redress towards the bill for compensation. I don't believe the taxpayer should really take the full hit. And they should have, they, they should have to do that for sitting on their hands for so long, knowing exactly what that situation was. The post office. Apart from individual accountability, maybe like for like action, maybe they should sacrifice their pensions. Maybe they should do community service. I can't believe any of them are going to end up in prison. Also, there needs to be a clean slate and a clear out at the top of the post office to put it back on track to regain its rightful status. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the chair? Yeah. Thousands of people have invested their life savings believing the post office to be a true and trusted brand. And when Horizon went wrong, the post office hid the truth and banked the proceeds of their crime. And when the unexplained windfall appears in suspense accounts, instead of finding out why, they transfer the proceeds to the bottom line. And as a result of it, top executives are showered with bonuses and honours. The words of Nick Wallace still ring in my ears when he looked around the High Court during the group litigation and noted that all those present were earning a wage apart from the victims. Now I see the inquiry. Nothing's changed. Everybody's being paid apart from the victims. I'm just going to turn now to see if the chair has any questions for you. Do you have any questions, chair? No, no, thank you, Miss Kennedy. Um, you won't be surprised to learn, Mr. Martin, that I read the Sunday Times article about you. <laughs> I have, I had, of course, by then read your witness statement, but. Um, Newspaper articles are also informative in a, in a more nuanced way. And now I've heard from you directly. So I have a good deal of very relevant information about you. And thanks for taking the trouble for coming to give evidence. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Now, just one formality. Um, Miss Kennedy mentioned the fact that you'd made a timeline or a chronology for yes. this afternoon, which is going to be made an exhibit. I don't want you to worry about um, the, 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 that formal status for that document. But can I just ask you, I take it that that document was from, prepared from documents in your possession, and that's where you get the dates from uh, and such <laughs> like. Yes. I, I prepared it because when I was interviewed to make my statement, or my witness statement, the order in which the questions were put were not relevant to the timeline. Yeah, OK. And I got a few things round the wrong way, so I had to get in my own mind the actual timeline. So well, some of those timeline entries appear.
appear to be a little bit disjointed with, with the witness statement. That's all right. And um, that's something we share in common, because whenever I prepare for a case, I love to make myself a chronology. So there we are. It's an age thing. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to divulge whether I'm younger or older than you. <laughs> right, thank you, Mr. Martin. And um, thank you, sir. that's it for the day, is it, Ms. Kennedy? Yes, that's right. Right, OK, so we start again at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Yes, thank you, Chair. All right, thanks very much, everyone. Oh, sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, I'm being told 10.15. 10 right, uh, OK, so then, of course, th and that's to take account of the fact that there might be a fire alarm exercise. Exactly, exactly. Fine, all right. So I'll see everyone at 10.15 in the morning. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>